Lesson 2.6 is about families of functions. Our objective is that we can analyze transformations of functions. So let's begin by talking about what a family is of functions. A family is a set of functions in which each function is a transformation of the parent function. So just like each member of a human family is like its parent, same thing with the functions. A function that is part of a family has some resemblance of the parent function. So now let's talk about what a parent function is and what a transformation is, and then I'll let you know what the basic transformations are that we're going to be studying. A parent function is the simplest form in a set of functions that form a function. So for example, linear functions. This is the type of function that we are mo most used to from Algebra 1. Linear functions form a family, so the parent function of a linear function would be y equals x because that's the b most basic or simplest form of a linear equation. A few members of this family include y equals 2x, y equals negative x plus 1, and y equals 1 half x minus 3. All three of those members of the linear family are transformations of the parent function y equals x. So basically you just change or multiply or add or subtract something about that parent function to change it into that member. A transformation is a change made to the equation of the parent function. And the four basic transformations that we're going to focus on today are known as vertical translations, horizontal translations, which means we're either shifting the graph up or down, left or right, as well as vertical stretches and compressions. Stretches means that the graph is being stretched or elongated, and compressions mean that the graph is being squished or compressed. And then reflections basically mean that we're flipping the graph. So you can see in the two graphs below, a vertical translation would just be shifting the graph up. You can see in the blue curve and then shifting it down in the green curve. And the vertical translations are just the number outside, so plus k or minus k. And then for horizontal translations, you're either shifting the graph left or right. So left would be the blue graph and right would be the green graph. And you can see that when you go left, the h value is inside of the parentheses and it's a positive h. And then when you're going right, the h value is inside the parentheses and is a negative. Here is the formal definition of a translation. It shifts the graph of the parent function horizontally, vertically, or both without changing the shape or orientation. So make sure on your graphs that you label the up, down, left, and right. And below, make sure you write f of x plus or minus k for a vertical translation. And for a horizontal translation, make sure you write f of x plus or minus h. So whatever numbers are in the K and H position, that is what tells you what direction uh, we are going. In example one, we're going to take a look at a couple functions and see how they're related to each other, and then also graph the vertical translation. So in example one, it says, how are the functions y equals x and y equals x minus 2 related? How are their graphs related? So before making the graph, let's make a table of values. And I typically choose numbers around 0. So I have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. When I input those x values for the function y equals x, I get out the same numbers. And when I input those inputs for the other function y equals x minus 2, I get out negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. Hopefully you agree. So you can see that each output for y equals x minus 2 is 2 less than the corresponding output for y equals x. After plotting these points and connecting them to make a line for each one, we see that the graph of y equals x minus 2 is the graph of y equals x translated down to units. So you can see that the minus 2 after the x is telling us that we're shifting the graph down to units. In part b, we're going to take a look at a similar concept, except instead of a line, we're going to deal with a parabola. Using the same input values for x, I found the output values for the equation y equals x squared minus 1, and then I plotted those points to create this parabola. Now what we need to do is translate each point up 5 units. So we just want to count up 5 from the current points. 
So you can see that the blue parabola drawn above the original parabola is the graph of the transformation or translation in this case, up five units. And the equation of the blue parabola is y equals x squared plus four because the original y-intercept of negative one was now translated up five units. So that means it goes through positive five. I also substituted in the same input values for x into the new equation y equals x squared plus 4 just to check and you can see that every value in the last column is 5 greater than the corresponding value in the middle column. So this is just a confirmation that we did the right thing. So here are a few basic examples about vertical translations, which we just discussed, and then also some horizontal translations. So vertical translations are typically easier to understand because the number is always outside of the inputs, and it's self-explanatory. So if it's a positive number outside, then you're going up. If it's a negative number outside, you're going down. The trickier part is always the horizontal translations because it looks like the opposite of the way that we think. So the reason why it's the opposite of the way that we think is because the general form is f of x minus h. So the minus sign is part of the formula. So when you're going right, for example, plus 2, shifting 2 units to the right, you're inputting a positive 2, so that minus sign is still there. So that's why we have f of x minus 2 for shifting 2 units to the right. However, if you're going left, 3 units to the left, that means you're inputting a negative 3. There's already a subtraction symbol there, so that's why the double negative becomes a positive. So shifting 3 units to the left would mean we would have f of x plus h. Now in example 2, we're going to have a chance to put that knowledge to the test and make sure we understand. In example two, we have the graph shows the projected altitude f of x of an airplane scheduled to depart an airport at noon. If the plane leaves two hours late, what function represents this transformation? A two hour delay means the plane leaves at 2 p.m. This shifts the graph to the right two units. Because we're shifting the graph two units to the right, the function f of x minus two represents this transformation. The y values of the delayed flight correspond to the x values two hours earlier than the delayed flight. So the altitude doesn't change even if the airplane is leaving later, just the time changes. So that's why our function is f of x minus 2. Now let's talk about reflections. When you're performing a reflection, you're flipping the graph across a line, which is typically the x or y axis. Each reflected point and its corresponding original point are the same distance away from the line of reflection. When you reflect a graph in the y-axis, the x values change signs and the y values stay the same. So in order to find the new coordinates for when reflecting across the y-axis, you would just do f of negative x. So that means the x values change signs, but the y values stay the same. When you're reflecting across the x-axis, the x values stay the same and the y values change signs. So in order to figure out the new coordinates when you reflect across the x-axis, you just multiply the output values or the f of x values by negative 1, which means the signs change for the y values. Example 3, it says, let g of x be the reflection of f of x equals 3x plus 3 in the y-axis. What is the function rule for g of x? So I double underline y-axis. In the y-axis or across the y-axis means the same thing. For a reflection in the y-axis, we need to change the sign of the x. So that's why I have g of x equals f of negative x. So from there, we're going to substitute in negative x for the x in the function that we're given. So g of x equals f of negative x. And using the function that we're given, 3 of negative x, or 3 times negative x plus 3 and then you just multiply 3 times negative x, and that is negative 3x, and drop down the plus 3. So the new function, after you reflect this f of x function in or across the y-axis, you get the equation g of x equals negative 3x plus 3. And we can check that by graphing f of x and g of x. When graphing both functions, you can see that we definitely did reflect the original equation 3x plus 3, and the new function negative 3x plus 3 is the reflection across the y-axis. Okay, so far we've talked about translations and reflections. Now let's move on to talking about stretches and compressions, which are the opposite of each other. 
So for a vertical stretch, you multiply all of the y values or the output values by the same factor that is greater than 1. So here in the box I have a times f of x where a is greater than 1. And you can use any number greater than 1 for the number in front. And you can see in the graph in the red that we have a stretch. So you can see that the graph is elongated or stretched out. The opposite of a stretch is a compression, and that's when you multiply all the y values by the same factor between 0 and 1, aka a decimal between 0 and 1, or a fraction between 0 and 1. So in the box I have a times f of x, where a is between 0 and 1 and not including those endpoints. So in the graph above you can see we have the green curve and that is definitely being um, compressed or squished together. In example 4 we're either going to stretch or compress a function and hopefully remember dilations from geometry from last year. That's what stretching and compressing are. The table at right represents the function f of x. What are the corresponding values of g of x and the possible graphs for the transformation g of x equals 3 times f of x? Because the 3 is bigger than 1, I know this is going to be a stretch. So what we want to do is multiply each of the output values of f of x by 3 to find each corresponding value of g of x. So I showed that in the table. So our g of x output values are 6, negative 9, 3, and negative 6. And now we're going to use those values from the table to draw a graph for f of x and g of x. So here's the graph of f of x and g of x, and it is visibly obvious that the graph of f of x was stretched. So the points are more spread out for the graph of g of x. If we were to do a compression, the points or the y values would be multiplied by a number between 0 and 1, and the points would be closer together or condensed. This take note box will really help you organize all the information that we learned today. So for vertical translations, you're changing the y values. So that's why we're adding or subtracting by a constant number k. So if we're going up, shifting graph up, that means we're adding k. And if we're shifting the graph down, that means we're subtracting the k. For horizontal translations, we're changing the x values. So that's why the constant value h is inside because we're changing the input values. So minus h, if it looks like a negative h, that means we're translating right. And if it looks like a positive h, that means we're translating left. For a vertical stretch or compression, vertical stretch, you're multiplying by a number greater than 1, which means the graph is getting bigger. And for a vertical compression, you are multiplying by a number that is between 0 and 1, and the graph is getting smaller. For reflections, you are flipping over the x-axis if you are multiplying the output values by a negative, and you are flipping over the y-axis if you're multiplying the input values by a negative. In example 5, we see that we can combine transformations. Part A says the graph of g of x is the graph of f of x equals 4x compressed vertically by the factor of 1 half and then reflected in the y-axis. What is the function rule for g of x? Compressed vertically by a factor of 1 half means we're going to be multiplying 4x by 1 half. So that means we have 2x for that transformation. And then from there, reflecting in the y-axis means that the x values are changing signs. So that means we want to multiply the x values by negative 1. So that means the function rule for g of x is negative 2x. In part B, we're given the equation of two functions, and we need to figure out what transformations change the graph of f of x to the graph of g of x. We need to write g of x in terms of f of x. So look at the equation g of x, 6x squared minus 1. We want to factor out the 3 from the 6x squared term, because there is no 3 with a 2x squared. When we factor out 3, we have 3 times 2x squared minus 1. So you can see the 2x squared is the f of x, so we can replace that with f of x. The 3 in front of the f of x means that we are stretching f of x vertically by a factor of 3. And the minus 1 after that means we are translating the graph down one unit. 
That wraps up the lesson for 2.6. Here's our lesson check problems for this lesson. Make sure you write them down and complete them. Please let me know if you have any questions the next time we see each other, and I will do my best to help you.